Okay, I guess this is a good time to start talking about infectious diseases. This is chapter 8 out of 10 chapters for general pathology. If you recall, in chapter 6, we talked about diseases of uh, generally inflammatory nature regard to, uh, in regards to antigens, which we in inherently have in our body. These were the so-called autoimmune diseases. In chapter 7, we talked about diseases involving mutations of uh, gene that regulate growth, which were neoplastic diseases. Now we'll be talking about diseases due to uh, antigens that are intrinsic, extrinsic to our body, which are generally referred to as infectious diseases. Uh, I also would like to say that uh, I enjoy doing this chapter very much, but it is uh, it's difficult sometimes to uh, tread the fine line between what I'll what is important in terms of pathology and what I already know you people will be learning in uh, things like microbiology and immunology. So uh, I absolutely do not have the time or the desire to go over all of the infectious diseases in detail because they will be covered uh, from your microbiology courses or in the uh, sections we do on systemic pathology. So that's why we will be breezing through a lot of things. Another thing I want to warn you about for infectious diseases uh, as an introductory statement is that a lot of these pictures are going to look very busy. They're going to have a lot of charts, a lot of small print, and I'm not too sure how YouTube is going to handle it. I know that my big files will be quite adequate in terms of image resolution, but when YouTube uh, crunches this down, you may have a very hard time uh, seeing things. Nevertheless, I'll keep my big files, and if you really, really need to see some of this stuff, I know you're going to email me and ask me anyway. So uh, let's start to do the chapter. In fact, let's not start to do the chapter. Let's do uh, something that I usually save at this point in the course called a rant. And I'll try to keep this rant short because I had a, uh, uh, a nice introduction that took up a lot of time. We're going to talk about AAA. And you know, all of this stuff that I teach you in pathology doesn't make a damn bit of uh, good for you unless you really have to understand what you really have to learn. Now, I can teach you about pathology, but your success as a practitioner will have nothing to do with how well you do on my exams or memorize what I tell you. Your success as a real American doctor with a real license will depend on AAA. And this is something that is known universally in private practice and you may never have any references to it in regular medical school, so I want to tell you right now. You are going to be successful only if you have AAA. And they're in this order. The first A stands for availability. The second A, which is the second most important thing, stands for affability or how well you relate to people, how well you are known as a nice guy, so to speak, even if you're a girl. And the third A represents ability. Isn't that amazing? Because you can get uh, the highest score on my exam and be a pathology genius, but if you're not available for consults or you're not known as, as being a nice, affable guy and you are only able which is the third A, you're not going to be very successful. So keep that in mind. Number one A is availability. Number two A is affability. Take your referrals out for dinner every now and then. Meet their families. The third A is ability. And believe me, you'll all have that. And that's why it's the least most important. Let's talk about the uh, phylogeny of infectious agents. Uh, I guess we could move up or down the evolutionary tree if you want to think of it that way. Uh, at the very lowest level, we have classes of infectious agents which don't even have DNA, and those are called prions. Most 
uh, infections uh, in humans are either viruses or bacteria, so that's why they get the big asterisks. If you want to include fungi, we'll add a third asterisk. But remember, if you really want to be thorough and classify the categories of infectious agents, you have to move up the tree from prions to viruses, including viruses like bacteriophages, plasmids, and transposons, which infect basically other infectious organisms like bacteria and do not affect man themselves if you want it to be complete and then we'll have our whole category of bacteria of various types then we're going to have our obligate intracellular organisms that can't live except if they're living somewhere in your body or your cell like chlamydia rickettsia mycoplasma then we'll have somewhat higher organisms called fungi which basically can be classified of various types but in from pathology point of view, uh, they're either yeasts or hyphae. And then we'll have these big critters uh, called parasites, which if they are only one cell, they're called protozoans. If they're uh, more than one cell, they're called metazoans. Generally speaking, metazoans and worms are pretty much uh, synonymous. Technically, arthropods have a lot of uh, cells, but they're generally known as ecto parasites, whereas these other two are primarily endo because the ecto pretty much stay outside or mostly outside the body. So this is going to be the evolutionary uh, model that we follow. And I hope this uh, next picture here doesn't blow your mind, and I hope you could see it too. So if I can't, I apologize because there will be a few pictures like this. Let's look at uh, some of the properties of these general uh, infectious pathogens. We talked about their taxonomy going up from viruses to chlamydia to rickettsia to mycoplasma to the higher bacteria to fungi to protozoa to helminths. And these can generally be thought of as evolutionary progression, but as you know, you know the viruses are just as uh, smart as the helminths in terms of the fact that they've been able to live just as long. And we're talking about more of an anatomic complexity here. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the sizes of infectious particles range from, let's say, 20 nanometers up to 10 meters if you have a 30-foot-long worm in your intestine. And we're going to talk about their sites of propagation, too. For example, Viruses, chlamydia, rickettsia, you can't culture them. They have to live inside of cells. So that's why they call them obligate intracellular. When you get to the mycoplasmas, they can be extracellular. But most common infectious agents, like bacteria, fungi, protozoas, uh, involve uh, propagation either through skin, mucosa, uh, facultative, intracellular, extracellular, uh, and they basically uh, have a very intimate relationship with human cells and human tissue boundaries called uh, mucosa. We're going to give uh, samples of each one, uh, and we're not going to go into the actual uh, specifics of all of these organisms. We just don't have the time. I'm assuming you're going to either uh, get that from micro or get that as you know it and I am not planning to go into any extensive discussion on each one so here's some sample species for a virus I think uh, a good general uh, goal for this chapter would be if you heard of a disease you should instantly be able to classify it as whether it's from one of these uh, six or seven categories now you should know polio is a virus you show, should know that trachoma is uh, chlamydia. You should know that rickettsia, a Rocky Mountain spotted fever, or typhus fever is rickettsial. You should know that mycoplasma pneumonia is mycoplasma, which is different from bacteria or viruses. You should know if you hear a disease like cholera, pneumonia, tuberculosis, that these are different types of uh, bacteria. You should know if you hear a disease like tinea's, thrush, sporotrichosis, histoplasmosis, that these are fungi. You should know giardia, sleeping sickness, Chagas disease, are protozoans, so is Cala azar. We'll mention these briefly. And if you hear a worm disease, 
whether it's a uh, nematode or some other type of worm, uh, like enterobia, filariasis, or trichinosis, you should know that these are helmets. Thank you very much for now.